Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Sebastian. Um, he is a PhD student at the University of Stuttgart. He is on a lot of interesting work on applying machine learning to um, wireless, um, to physical layer communications, ranging from channel coding modulation all the way to the end-to-end -end communication systems. And he has received several awards, um, one of which is the best publication award at um, of the University of Stuttgart in 2019. So it's going to talk about um, trainable communication systems from theory to practice and back again today. Um, so let's let's welcome Sebastian. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, for the nice introduction. Um, maybe a few words in advance. So in case there's anything is unclear, you have a question, just let me know and um, or maybe sound quality is poor. So maybe just raise your hand write it in the chat and uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, yeah, a few words about this talk. Um, it's, I, was, I was told it, I, I have roughly one hour. I hope that's fine. Um, as I said, whenever there's a question, we can also discuss a bit on, on a few slides and so on. So it's not necessarily a, a feed forward talk here. Um, Okay, then um, about my collaborators. So this is not just my work. This is, of course, the work of, of a whole team here in, in Stuttgart and also in Nokia Bell Labs. So it's joint work with Sebastian Dörner, Jakob Heudes, and Stefan Tenbrink, and yeah, many others, of course, but these are the main contributors to this talk. I will speak about uh, trainable communication systems. And um, the idea is somehow to, to summarize our, our yeah, long journey in the last years from theory to practice. and back again that's the important thing because when you move towards practical implementations you actually figure out that many things in practice are hard to solve and you have to reconsider it in your theoretical model and you have to refine your theory to finally make progress in, in the practical system so um, that's the essential idea of this talk um, so in the very beginning we thought about um, actually why is deep learning a good idea but we could only find reasons why it's actually a bad idea um, to use deep learning for communication. So it's not about deep learning, it's about communications, but the combination. Um, so you all know this guy, it's uh, Claude Shannon, and um, he actually came up with the fundamental limits of communications. And of course, many others also um, formulated a lot of, of bounds and um, fundamental limits here. And we know that many systems operate actually pretty close to these limits. So the question would be, is there actually room for improvement? So why should we apply deep learning um, if we already have these systems that operate so well. And then the other thing is that we deal with man-made signals. Um, so we have the full control of the encoder. We can control the system, uh, the, the signal, and we have very good channel models. So why should we use deep learning? So um, it would actually even end the talk here then. So we thought a bit more about, hey, maybe we can still find reasons why it could be a good idea. And um, yeah, we found, found these reasons. Um, so all these system models are obviously also inadequate in a certain sense that we can never capture full reality. Um, think about non-Gaussian uh, systems, non-stationary systems and all these things. And once you go into optics, for instance, then the whole world becomes non-linear and uh, it's much more complicated to find the optimal solution for that. And also um, this block structure we will see in today's talk um, that we typically optimize the system for say with an engineering perspective that we do subdivide into individual blocks and all this optimization is, is in a certain sense all suboptimal. Um, and with deep learning, as we will see, we have the possibility to combine blocks to optimize the whole system with an end-to-end -end metric. And then also in terms of um, realization or implementation, there may be gains in, in terms of how you implement your algorithm in hardware and, Neural networks, you can may have a universal hardware accelerator that actually just executes your program. You can have many parallel operations by many classical algorithms are actually serial algorithms. So it's it, on every, from every perspective, there is potential gain. So let's just see uh, where this leads to and, and whether it, whether we can build such a system with neural networks. Okay, so a, a very quick, um, yeah, scheme when you could use machine learning or, or why you should machine, le um, machine learning for communication. So is machine learning for you? First question you should ask yourself, do you have a model? If the answer is yes, you have a model, 
the question is, do you have an algorithm that solves your problem? If you have such an algorithm, the question would be, uh, is it too complex? So for instance, maximum likelihood decoding for channel codes is often too complex. If it's not too complex, you should not use machine learning. You have a model, you have an algorithm, it's not too complex, so you have solved the problem already. But if you don't have a model, then the question would be, do we have access to data? If we have no access to data, no model, then okay, forget about it. There's nothing to learn. But once we don't have access to data, we can give it a try and we can use machine learning here. And then the same as if we don't have a model. So typically we have access to data, we can just draw samples from the model. Um, and of course, if the algorithm is too complex. So this is a very simple um, scheme, but I think it's also close to, maybe you've heard of Osvaldo Simeone who, who had this distinguished between a model deficit and algorithm deficit. And um, I think that's quite common in, in this deep learning literature these days. So um, yeah, always Bastion, ask you. Here, here are our second speaker. Last Friday, our speaker was Osvaldo and he talked about that. So it's pretty funny in the comments. Oh, perfect. <laughs> So you know as well, though, and uh, you know this, this this basic scheme. So you should always ask yourself: Does it make sense, or, or why do I apply machine learning? That's that's the point. But then I can actually go on. Um, but we have also new material compared to Osvaldo. Um, but one important thing we should always keep in mind: so um, why is data so important? Um, it's often significantly easier to collect data than explicitly write the program. So this statement from Carpati here. Um, so the idea is that we can measure things, we can collect data, and that's easier than to solve this problem explicitly. If this is not fulfilled anymore, then of course machine learning is probably the wrong tool. But once this, this, this holds, then it's actually a good idea to simplify things. So you can also think of that as kind of software 2.0, where you have different we replace the source code by data, we replace the compiler by deep learning, and the final program is now just a predictor to the neural network here. Okay, then um, this was the why should we use machine learning, but how can we actually use it? So we also have to distinguish here a bit um, into different, yeah, let's say classes of learning or um, categories of learning. Um, so one thing is the, the probably most straightforward approach, so-called a priori learning or offline learning. So we just take one signal processing block, replace it by a neural network, for instance, channel coding, and we just may have an improvement in terms of better performance, better accuracy or lower latency or whatever. So that's the, we can just do that offline. We just replace the component and we sell the product. And then the other thing is, um, in Z2 learning or online learning, pretty more common name. Um, so we implement the network in runtime or on the fly and we try to retrain the system to adapt to changing environments. So this is a fundamental difference. We want to update the system during runtime. And this makes the system much more adaptive, of course, but on the other hand, it costs a lot of com computational complexity and it's often it's unclear how you would actually do that in, in practice. And then, the last um, category, which I find also very interesting, and we had some nice results here, is at temporarium learning. So the question is, can we learn something during design time or for design time? So can we train a system? For instance, we learn a specific channel code, we learn the structure of a code, and then afterwards we interpret the result and we try to learn something for classical signal design. So we go back into classical signal design and use the insights from deep learning to uh, yeah, further improve the, the classical system. So in the final system, there is no deep learning involved in that sense. So there is no neural network on the chip, but there are insights that have been yeah, gained from, from deep learning here. And um, yeah, so these are the different techniques. So we can mention many examples for, for all these different techniques here, um, but most of this talk is actually about yeah, offline learning, about replacing the whole communication communications link here. Okay, um, with that, I would like to outline the talk. Um, we will quickly look into what are autoencoders. I'm not sure about your background, um, whether you have seen that, but I think it's important to, to introduce the concept. We will look into training through non-differentiable components. This means that for physical channel, we have difficulties to, to, yeah, to, oper to, to train the system because we have so-called missing channel gradient. We'll see what that means in a, 
on these fights. And then some bit more theoretical considerations. So what actually happens if we trade this autoencoder? Why is the cross entropy loss the best choice? And what's the fundamental meaning of it in terms of communications, of course. And then finally, we will move from symbol-wise to bitwise transmission of information. Um, but it's impor also important to understand the basics. So we'll just start with symbol-wise autoencoder and then we'll develop the whole concept towards bitwise uh, transmission. Okay, what's an autoencoder? Um, this is now plain machine, uh, machine learning um, setup. So we have a neural network and we divide it into an encoder network and decoder network. And in between we have so-called penalty layer. Um, we train this network now such that the output equals its input. So you may have heard of that. That's a pretty old concept from. Yeah, I, think you, I think you can assume that like, uh, as a baseline, all of us have read like Tim and uh, Jacob's paper from a couple of years ago. You kind of have a like basic understanding of the, the framework. Ah, okay, perfect, perfect. So you're familiar with this basic concept. So this is an autoencoder and it's good actually then can go to the more interesting stuff. Um, so um, yeah, this, is, this, this should be clear then. Um, so it's, it's, we have this penalty layer and um, yeah, that's the, the whole magic here. Um, okay, then we can go to, to Shannon and you have probably read this quote also in this context several times. So the fundamental problem of communication is that of reproducing a message select or at one point, selected at another point. So what we in the end, what we want to do or what the whole, what's the whole task of a communication system is to reproduce messages at different points. That's the whole, whole idea. And now um, about terminology. So we have typically, of course, transmitter receiver. So we will use S as a message, which is taken from an alphabet with M samples, uh, alphabet size M. So for instance, 256, and then we can transmit K is log two of M. Uh, bits of information. We have X, that's the channel input, Y, which is the channel output, and S hat, which is the estimate on the transmitted message S. We will use this terminology throughout the whole, um, whole talk. And um, a few minor details. So the trans so X has a certain power normalization. Otherwise, um, after training, your X would probably um, explode. Uh, so there's, you need a normalization here. Um, we will typically use a complex valued notation. So we just interpret two consecutive free valued numbers as a complex valued number. Uh, so whenever we talk about neural networks, then we will use two real valued numbers and we talk about the communications on the channel, then we talk about one complex valued number. That's just a different interpretation of the values. Um, and then important is actually the information rate. So with one channel use, we transmit K information or K over N uh, information, uh, bit, information bits per complex value channel use per thread uh, terminology. Okay, and um, how is this problem solved today? Of course, you all, you're all aware of that and uh, we have transmitter receiver, we have many signal processing blocks and all of them solve individual tasks like modulation, pulse shaping coding and all these things. And um, it's actually, I don't say this is not a good idea at all. Um, it's from an engineering perspective, of course, it works extremely well and, and, and we have these, these good systems. But on the other hand, uh, it's also suboptimal for specific applications if we have nonlinear channels, if we have very short messages and all these things. And then it may be not the best choice just to optimize the whatever the, the synchronization or the modu demodulation without considering the, the coding, for instance. So you cannot treat these blocks independently if you want the optimal performance. So we asked the question, can we just replace that by a neural network? And of course, you know, Jakob's paper, so we can do that. Um, so we can just interpret this as an autoencoder now. So this is a very simple autoencoder um, where we have a few dense layers. We interpret, again, pre as complex number, uh, complex valued numbers. We have a normalization layer, the channel, and at the receiver, we have again the neural network with soft max output. Now, this is a symbol wise autoencoder. We send one symbol and we estimate the symbol. You can use that with one hot representation, for instance. Okay, um, a few details. I guess that's not so important for the moment. We can model any, any channel we want Gaussian, uh, AWGN layers. We can have a multi tap fading and all these things, depending on your exact problem here. 
Um, of course, we can now do end-to-end -end training so we can update the transmitter and receiver jointly together. And um, we will see that this has a practical, practical issue, of course, but um, in theory, we could try to learn transmitter and receiver jointly. And the, the important thing is that we optimize one single matrix, that we don't have an explicit modulation, explicit coding, and so on. So we just jointly optimize the system. OK. Um, one word about the transmitter, if you think about it. It's actually, um, we have a discrete input, one index, and we have a discrete output. So you can just realize the whole transmitter in terms of an embedding or a lookup table and not as a, let's say, neural network. So there's some papers, they consider encoding complexity, at least in this discrete realization, I think it's not an issue. So you can have a neural network, of course, for training, but then the final, uh, yeah, realization, this can be just a simple lookup table here. Um, there, you'll see there are diff, diff, some special realizations. Um, for instance, if this is now SNR dependent, then it becomes a continuous function, um, then the situation changes. But for the very basic setup, this can be just a simple lookup table. Okay, um, now I have an example just to see what's, what happens. So this is a toy example now. and. Um, Okay, let's go to m equals eight. So now we have um, just a eight PSK. So in terms of the parameters, so we learn we have a message alpha or alphabet size of eight, and um, the reference system is now an eight PSK. You can see the red constellation points here, and we just let an auto encoder learn to um, optimize the symbol error rate here or the cross entropy. On the right hand side, you can see the symbol error rate from the reference system and from our auto encoder. Now the system is actually initialized randomly. So we can see that the points are somewhere in, in, the, in the nowhere. And on the, on the right hand side, we also see that the receiver does not work very well or does not work at all. So we have an extremely high error rate. And now we start the training and we, up, we do more and more training steps. So I hope you can see that the, the points are moving around. Um, so maybe it was even too fast, so let's run it again. So in the beginning, it's just somewhere and then it starts to to um, converge to this interesting solution. I will stop it. Okay. Now this point moves to the center here and we can just stop it. And the final solution we have found is now an, yeah, a seven PSK and a, a zero symbol. And um, you can also see that the, the symbol error rate actually improves uh, when you compare it to the conventional APSK. I don't want to oversell this and I don't want to claim that this is something new. Um, you can find that, um, of course, there's a nice page from Eric Eckrell. He has all these um, sphere packing uh, or spheres, sphere packing solutions here on his web page for high dimensional um, constellations even. So it's nothing uh, spectacular, but it's interesting to see that um, this neural network actually converges to such a nice solution here. Um, and you can do that, of course, for also for m equals 16, for instance. Um, can continue this for a while. And what we see is interesting, a more circular structure than a rectangular structure. We'll also see this difference uh, later when we talk about the bitwise autoencoder. Um, find that quite quite nice in terms of visualization. Okay. Okay. Can, yeah. can you just create that on an of like Gaussian noise channel, Sebastian? Sort of like in, this is like basically kind of the exact same thing as in Tim and um, uh, Jay, Jakob's paper you just showed, but uh, like, I guess we, I hadn't seen that 8 PSK result before. That's, that's kind of interesting. I'll have to get that on a future digital com. Uh, uh, midterm find like the probability of error of that uh, <laughs> the, 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 the the constellation you just showed with the the point at on the origin and the seven equally spaced points on a circle that's that's uh that's cute um so but yeah but i just was asking so you were training this kind of like how they trained it in their paper just 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 training on added white gaussian noise with cross entropy loss and, and so on yep it's just okay. and we may even have the source code somewhere um it may be linked in the slides i have to check but it's this is really super simple. Um, yeah, so of course you 
by the way, so the hardware guys, they don't like this, this zero crossing here. So you could just yeah. add this as a constraint, for instance. Can I ask you a question, quick question? Yeah, sure. Um, so for this slide, um, so for the learned constellation, um, there's a point at origin. I mean, I'm just wondering I mean, if, this, if this can cause some problems in RF implementation. So yeah, we are yeah, like it, a DC it, offset. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's what I mean. So the hardware guys, they don't they don't like it. Um, but here, it, this was not the, the constraint we put on the other encoder. So we just optimized for Gaussian noise and we optimized the uh, yeah, cross entropy or simple error rate. So yeah, yeah. Because so, this, this this is just a baseband point of view, and you, we don't know what happens in the RF implementation, right? I mean, there can be additional RF loss due to learning yeah. this constellation, and maybe this constellation may be even worse, right? Exactly, yeah, okay. of course. Thank you. But, but that's the point. So we will see then when once we move to, to practical implementations, we can just learn over this, let's say, physical channel. And then we somehow consider all these uh, constraints. But for the moment, it's just a nice visualization to see what learning actually does here. OK, um, so let's continue then some so, yeah, one last um, slide about Sumo-wise autoencoders. Um, this is an, now an um, autoencoder with 200 alphabet size 256. So we transmit 8 bit of information, but we do that in four complex value channel users. So we have a constellation now, a multi-dimensional constellation diagram, which now consists of four yeah, transmissions. Here. And we do that for the Gaussian channel. So we see such a yeah, random distribution here. And um, you can now interpret that, for instance, the red rectangular here, or red square. So this one, this point, this point, this point would belong to message index one, for instance. And then message index two would be whatever the, the, the star, for instance, and we transmit these four points. For instance. Um, and this works. But now if we change to a channel which has a phase rotation, so it just rotates and we don't know we have somehow need a pilot to, to compensate for this phase rotation, but we don't provide this pilot explicitly. So the system needs to learn how to, how to compensate this, this rotation. And um, what, we've, what we observe is that this, the constellation now changes towards such a yeah, superimposed pilot structure where we, if you look at the center of these uh, distributions here, this is not around zero anymore. And this is in, in a classical, um, it's hard to interpret actually, but in the classical um, communications domain, this is typically known as superimposed pilots. So you combine the pilots with the information in the same, uh, in the same symbols here. Mm -hmm. And um, interestingly, it works. So it can actually compensate the, compensate the phase rotation. So um, yeah, you so can here imagine- you're just multiplying, So you're just taking whatever symbol you, you encode, you're multiplying it by e to the j theta or theta some random number that you pick and then fix. And so, and then you're yeah. trying to retrain the whole thing to basically get successful communication despite this unknown data value. Yep. That's, that's, the, yeah. that's the, the, that's the setup, yeah. And um, yeah, it, it works, of course. And uh, it's, you can imagine that we sp spend more time in interpreting the results than in actually modeling the, the problem. So this is, um, yeah, quite interesting. But uh, yeah, I think that was just a basic introduction to end-to-end -end learning or supervised autoencoders. Um, now we have an issue that um, telling you all this doesn't work very well for a practical system. Um, so I think we were first looking into this practical over the air transmission a few years ago, and we figured out it doesn't work. And if you think about the reason, it's simply how would you train the system in a practical setup? So you have the neural network transmitter, you can do the forward propagation, you can put it in on the weights on a software defined radio, for instance. So we transmit over the air, we record that somewhere, execute our receiver, we get an estimate. And now for the training, we have, need to back propagate the gradient through the receiver and then at a certain point we are stuck at the transmit at the, at the channel because there's simply no gradient available for the physical channel. Of course you can try to approximate that the, the channel gradients here but from a theoretical uh, perspective you don't never will never have an, an accessible channel gradient in a practical system because it simply does not exist. Um, so how, how can we apply 
our deep learning or end-to-end -end learning idea to a physical channel? That's the, the question of the next um, few minutes. So there's one very simple set, simple idea. We just try to find a channel model. So we try to model whatever may be there, or we just use models that we know from literature, um, Gaussian noise, phase rotation, all these things, quantization, for instance. And as we've seen before, it's often easier to model it than to explicitly solve the problem. Um, this can be done then, of course, we need a differentiable channel model, but that's, let's assume we have that, then we can do end-to-end -end learning. And then in a second phase, we just deploy our weights, trans transmit our weights, and we just do a receiver fine-tuning step. Because you can always update the receiver, you can record real-world data, and we only need to backpropagate the gradient from the right-hand side to the, or through the receiver here for receiver updates. So this works, but uh, of course it's not, uh, not the, the, the final solution. Um, that was actually the first, the first result. Um, don't want to go too much into detail here. So we compared it to a baseline. This was a 46 meter line of sight, um, pretty complex setup where we try to consider as many effects as possible. Um, and I receive, so the autoencoder is slightly worse than our baseline. This was in 2017. And then we do receive a fine tuning. We see a gain of roughly one dB, but we are still away from the from the baseline. And at the end of this talk, I, I hope that we we outperform our our baseline. So that's the the, the idea. Um, but I'll, yeah, of course, this was just a proof of concept, and I'm quite proud that it works. Um, yeah. Then one 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 pretty cool setup. Um, so how can you make this adaptive? How can you make it? Make on, or how can you enable online learning? So the idea was to use a conventional, can be the conventional system with trainable receiver components, or it can be an autoencoder. Um, then we use a channel that has some alterations that change over time, and we want to somehow adaptively retrain the system. If you would just do that, we need to, to, to send a lot of pilots for training. So the idea was, can we use an outer channel code um, to protect from transmission errors. So we detect whenever the autoencoder does an error, we correct that, and then we use this to, to create a labeled uh, data set here. So we have our neural network receiver, get an estimate out of the receiver. This may be inaccurate, or there may be errors because of the channel alterations. Put that into our return decoder in this case, can be also an LPC VP decoder, depending on the, the channel code you're using. Um, we store it in a database, detect whenever there was a transmission error or at least there was likely a transmission error. And then we just do it from time to time. We do a stochastic gradient descent update. So we could also do this um, receiver fine tuning in a continuous manner somehow at the receiver. This was one extension of, of receiver fine tuning. Okay. Um, but then we are at the, at the uh, layer more. Uh, later topic here now at generative adversarial networks. Now, instead of just modeling the channel by hand or handcrafted channel modeling, we will now use a, or try to train a neural network that estimates or that mimics the channel behavior. And that's kind of a learned channel model. And then the second step is of course the same. Once we have trained or learned this model, we can use the model to train our autoencoder. That's the idea of, of these generative adversarial networks. Um, the idea is also that we can do that in a data-driven manner. So we can just record data, we can train the system, and we can somehow yeah, capture all real-world effects, or at least a lot of uh, a lot of real-world effects here. So how does that work? Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with uh, generative adversarial networks. Um, so the basic idea is that we train a network. So this is nothing from the communications domain. This is now again from the from the machine learning domain. It's often used or the most famous application is to, to, to learn or to generate faces. Um, maybe one example, uh, probably I have to share my screen. Uh, let me see. Uh, I will just send around the link. It's probably easier than just to go back to the browser. There's a, a page, this person does not exist.com. So whenever you load the page, you see a new face. And um, the funny thing is that this, it's always a, a created face, so it's a, it's 
this person does really not exist. It's just a network that's behind this, um, this page and it creates a new person whenever you, you call the page. Um, let's go back here. And um, so this is this, the typical application of these generative adversarial networks. Um, but the idea was, okay, if it works for, for human faces, it may also work for channels. Of course, it's much more abstract. It's a bit more difficult to analyze, but um, let's give it a try. So what we have is we have a, a data set with real world samples, either human faces or just a channel data. And we, ha we have a generator that produces fake data or tries to mimic such a sample here. And for that, it has an, um, some stimulating noise that could be just with a Gaussian noise or uh, yeah, typically we use Gaussian noise. So it's just a latent variable that, that's not, that's only used to stimulate the generator. So we get an, a random output and that should now behave similarly than the original data distribution. And the task of the discriminator is to distinguish whether a sample was real world sample or it's actually fake data. That's the whole idea of these generative um, adversarial networks. Um, yeah, so for the training we now use, this is the, I think it was the, the, the first idea, this min-max game of how you can train um, such a generative network. So what we do is we actually, from discriminator's perspective, we maximize the, let's say, classification accuracy that a real world sample, so taken from the, the real data distribution, is classified as real world sample, while we minimize, so one minus, the accuracy that a fake sample is considered to be real. So we maximize the probability that a fake sample is considered to be fake. That's the, the perspective from the discriminator. And at the same time, we minimize from the generator's perspective the accuracy of the discriminator. So we try to find a um, distribution that is from generator's perspective is considered to be a real distribution or that samples are taken from the real distribution. So that's the idea. And then we train the generator and the discriminator in an alternative fashion here. I have a few words about the, the dimensions. So the, the generator is somewhat arbitrary dimension of the latent um, noise. So we just typically we use the same size. So we use L equals N. So we use the same input and output dimension. But um, I think there is, um, according to my knowledge or observation, there is no real, the channel is not so not so complex um, compared to human face, for instance. Uh, then um, the output, of course, must be the same, must be N, so the, the number of channel users. Um, minor note, this is now a real value channel use that's taken from different paper. Um, so it can be also 2n if you consider it to be a complex value channel use. That depends on the dimension, of course. Um, then, um, yeah, typical choice, we use just Gaussian simulating noise. And for the discriminator, we have, of course, input dimension Rn. So we have all the C dot vector x. And then, um, or actually it's y. And then um, we just have a certain probability or accuracy whether the output is uh, it's fake or not. Actually. So it's just a binary classifier. And then for the training, we just use sigmoid output activation and cross entropy loss. Okay, um, you can formulate the, the training algorithm. So we update discriminator, then we update the generator and so on. You have a lot of hyperparameters in the training, by the way, um, and this can easily become a nightmare. So you train this and the system becomes super unstable, it collapses and you get yeah, just random output. Um, so these hyperparameters are probably the crucial thing when we talk about, uh, about these generative adversarial networks. Um, yeah, there are also some heuristics that could be involved. Um, it's really, a, it's, it's re it really becomes art in that sense. Um, you, you, you optimize these things. And uh, what we did is actually we changed from this classical loss function here to the so-called Wasserstein metric, um, which turned out to be a bit more stable, particularly if we have um, multi-pass channels. So this is all worked very well. Once we just had a Gaussian channel or we had a Rayleigh, Rayleigh um, noise, but whenever we have multi-pass, it turned out to be a multi-pass channel, it turned out to become quite unstable. 
And that's, that was actually the reason why we changed this to the so-called uh, Wassersteinjahr. This sounds pretty complex, but in the end, in the terms of the implementation, it's, it's just a different, it's just a different loss. So essentially it's the same loss without the lock and the terminology just slightly changes. Okay, uh, but there's one, one more thing that we should consider is that we have to make this a conditional gun. Um, and of course, if we have a channel, we want to transmit information, we want to transmit the message. So um, we don't want to create a random sample. So we have to condition everything on X. So we train discriminator and generator conditioned on X. So we train over all possible um, messages M. So we, we have to consider all these, whatever, 256 different messages and tr um, train the system here. Okay. Now putting things together, um, we have this generator. Of course, we don't have a real data set depending on how you implement it, but we have access to our software defined radio so we can really intensive flow. We can distinguish whether we send a message over a channel or we send a message through the generator feed. That's just a, a matter of setup. There's one other issue is that if you think about X, X is the output of, of our auto encoder encoder. So this can be, can be actually anything. And if we have a channel that if we have a linear channel, for instance, a Gaussian channel, then it actually doesn't matter too much what, what choice of X we have. But when we have a nonlinear channel, it may depend on X. So the behavior of the channel may depend on X. And um, so for instance, a nonlinear channel, if X gets large, we have a saturation for instance. And um, this may be not considered if we train the system in the linear domain. So if we train the small x, for instance. It's just a simple example, but there could be also uh, more nonlinear effects. So what we have to do is we have to, or at least what we do, what we observe what works well, is that we retrain. So we first train an out, or we initialize our autoencoder. Then we take samples of x from this autoencoder. We adjust the, or we train the GAN. And then based on this train GAN, we update our autoencoder. And then we go, back and refine our, our generative adversarial network to be sure that the channel model in the region of X is always an, an accurate choice here. So that's, the, that's also an, a quite crucial part here in this, in this um, generative adversarial network. And the, the point is depending on your channel model or in your channel setup, you may not actually, may not face this issue or you may face it. It depends, really depends on the vulnerability of the channel. Um, that's the, the tricky part here. Okay, I think that's more interesting here. Now let's look at the, at the results. Um, so this was a um, the Wasser Schengen trained with a multi-carrier system, so which is an OFDM system, and we learned how to. Well, the, the, the sample was actually an OFDM frame now, so we have really a, I think it was a 50 megahertz range of input samples with a 60 for subcarriers. So it was quite a significant amount of samples. We put that into our training algorithm and we did that in the time domain. And um, what I find really surprising is to see that um, this is now the, the frequency response. And um, it, so the red curve is the, what we measured based on the recorded samples. And the blue one is the, the learned, um, solution from our generative adversarial network. And I, I would claim this is pretty pretty accurate. Um, was, so this was really measured over the air. It was an indoor scenario, like office environment. And uh, yeah, it was, was, was pretty interesting to see. Hey, so I think there's a question or two on the uh, chat box. Um, in particular, whether the generator is outputting um, at realizations of the channel or actually of the, the signal, the information bearing signal. Is the generator outputting? Ah, sorry, I didn't see the chat. Um, is the generator output channel realizations or received signal realization? Um, no, it's actually received signal realizations in, in our setup. Um, you could probably also extend that and, and learn channel realizations, but why, why should you? Uh, 
you know so i was just like confused like you were training a generator to output uh, receive signal realization but then you're going back and uh, retraining the auto encoder yep. like uh, so the generator uh, is serving as 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 what role here like it's implicitly learning the channel or something yep so it really mimics the channel so you have the channel for me is a black box put in x and you get out y and um now in in practice of course it, if it's nonlinear and so on it's it's a function that you put in x but it depends on x so if i change x so if for instance if i multiply everything by two i have a higher transmission power then the output is not two times y then the output is something i don't know of course depends on the channel and um to, so what would happen is that the network would actually we, we had a lot of these issues that the network actually even exploits so the autoencoder now exploits these effects because you may have some, let's say, inaccurate modeling of the channel from this generative network. And it's not that just that this is inaccurate. It actually happens that the, now this may lead to a, even to a, to a local minima of your autoencoder that now finds an X. And it is, for this particular X, your channel model is simply inaccurate. And now it even exploits this. So you will get a... a simply doesn't work in practice and so you just get a, a meaningless inter a meaningless result in the end if you want mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether this was easy to understand mm -hmm. okay thank you um is this the relevant paper let me check the link yeah exactly this is the the paper um so you have it in the chat um i think we also have this result um you can also see the details of the um, of the neural network, it's a conditional, uh, it's a convolutional neural network in this case because the OFDM um, frame length was pretty large and with a, let's say, fully connected network, it's simply too complex to learn it. So, but it's, a, I would say, pretty straightforward. It's just a few layers of connoid paths, you know. Uh, can and, I ask you a question? Just yeah. a follow-up question. So while uh, for the discriminator part, how do you model the channel? in the upper part. So to train the generator, uh, we need to take some samples, x and p, y given x above, right? Mm -hmm. So we need a model actually for the discriminator part. So how did you model that part? You mean this yeah. y here? Yeah, this y is what it's like hx plus n or whatever. I mean, how, how did you take it? It's, 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 it's a measurement. So we have software defined radios in the lab and we really transmit a lot of data. We record that and we just build a database. Is it an so, indoor environment? Yeah, it's AR. Yeah, we have both, but um, for this experiment, we used indoor, yeah. Okay, and uh, you, you just said that, I mean, uh, faces are more, let's say, complex than a channel in, while, while you are mentioning the GAN in general, right? The, the I mean, again, for if you consider the GAN, training again with faces are more complicated than training with channels. I mean, you mentioned that channels are relatively easier than human faces. I mean, human faces are more complex distribution, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe that was uh, a bit, bit too short. Um, yeah, so some channels are simple, but of course you can make every channel as complex as you want. So. Um, one thing we, we, I think we did publish it, but we, we um, looked into optical channels. Optical channels, okay. I mean, and, because uh, we, we tried uh, the same things and, you know, to my observation, uh, if you consider uh, realistic channel models that come from LT, channels seems more complex than human faces. So this is the reason why I'm asking, I mean, what kind of channel are you using? But yeah, thanks. So you are just yeah. using optical kind of channels, okay. Yeah, no, that's 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 right. Um, it's maybe too too easy to say that uh, human faces are yeah. uh, harder than a channel. So if your channel has too many, it's a multipath channel. You have too many tabs, for instance. So if it's a high dimensional problem, um, you're probably right. Yeah, this is actually an yeah, it's a bit, maybe also a bit philosophical question. Uh, what's more complex? But I, I I agree. So if you have too many filter tabs. Um, or channel tabs, it, it becomes super hard to learn it. Absolutely. 
So, Sebastian, like roughly, like how many samples did you need to learn a reasonable um generator? Like, how, how many samples? Like, um, how many realizations did you have to take? So this was for let me see, the numbers on the slide. It's uh, two hundred fifty nine thousand samples. Um, I have to say that the number of samples for us is not so critical. It's actually the transmission of these samples is, if you think about it, it's just a matter of a few few seconds maybe. So that's interestingly, it's it's it's. Of course, you have the you need to store it, you need to copy it, and so on. But but it's it's compared to the training time, it's actually not so much of an issue. Sure, right, right, yeah. I was I was kind of thinking a little bit about like the online learning, but I guess like this is more or less focused on offline training because like using yeah doing game training in the middle of like communication doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. So okay, yeah. No, no. I, I think that that that. that the channel if you think about coherence time of your channel it's it's actually pretty pretty tough yeah 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 okay, yeah. okay. uh if there's no further question i would maybe jump a bit um to to provide some more theoretical considerations of this um so there's i will skip this um probably have read it about it there's also reinforcement learning abroad which um helps to or is an alternative solution to the missing channel gradient. Um, I just have the slides here. I can also send you the slides after after the talk. You can just have a look. Um, oops. So maybe this is one slide I would like quickly to mention um, because it's yeah quite interesting. So what we did is we we now compared the different training methods in the same setup. And I think that's because there are many papers out there, but they have different training approaches, but it's hard to compare. And um, for that, we, we use a 16 from the setup. It's a, a 16 quam, uh, just a baseline, uh, which gives us the, yeah, well, this is magenta curve here. And um, if we now use our model-based training, so it was an OFDM setup, uh, also again, multi-carrier system, we actually, can see there's almost no gain with our autoencoder. And um, okay, the claim is that our model was pretty bad actually. So we, we weren't able to to model the, this OFDM channel well enough, I would claim. Then we did um, replace only the receiver of the network of the, of the baseline by a neural network and trained it and we can already see a huge gain. So um, we also see that in a theoretical consideration. So this tells us that our there's a receiver mismatch um, between the actual channel and what we assumed in our receiver. And then uh, comparing the, the GAN and reinforcement learning approach, I would claim the results are pretty similar. Um, keep in mind, this is a measurement. This was really done over the air. So there may be also a slight, um, even estimating the SNR has a slight offset. So this is probably in the same range, I would say. Um, but again, according to the question before, of course, it also depends heavily on the, on the channel. Uh, the, the channel setup. Okay, um, now a few more theoretical considerations. Um, so we have our transmitter receiver again, and the output is just a softmax activated output. That's the typical setup of our outer encoder. Now the question is, what is actually the best loss function? Why do we use the cross entropy function? So for that, um, a few considerations. So first of all, we assume again cross entropy, one hot representat representation of the input, and um, the output is now a, yeah, a posterior probability p tilde of s given y. Um, yeah, we assume that we have a unique mapping. So we assume that the, we don't map one, uh, two messages to the same, same x. That's typically a, Typically, you avoid that in your um, transmitter. And um, in terms of notation, we will use the sub-index um, theta, uh, tx and rx, to denote that this is a function that depends on the transmitter weights or the receiver weights correspond, um, just to, to, to keep track of that. Now, what we can do is we can use, a, we can reformulate our cross-entropy loss. Now, you can just go through the slides. Um, kind of, uh, it's not. It's not so. I think it's not so interesting to go through all of these steps. Um, 
but the result is quite interesting. So if you just rearrange that a bit and, and, and place a few terms, we will end up with this very simple and, and, and nice um, result that the cross entropy term can be divided into three individual terms, which is the entropy of our source. That's typically a constant because when we train the other encoder, um, the input entropies or the source entropy is fixed. Then we have minus the mutual information between X and Y. So this is the channel input and the channel output. Um, and keep in mind, we, mini, uh, we minimize the cross entropy. This means we maximize the corresponding mutual information term here. And then we have the kalbeck leibler divergence between the true a posterior probability that we don't know and the estimated um, a posterior probability, so the output of our receiver. And um, so you can interpret, so you, we know that this becomes zero if we have the same distribution. And this is exactly the interpretation. So if we have a true APP receiver, if our receiver is optimal, then this term here becomes zero. So what we do is actually we maximize the mutual information, assuming that we have an optimal, um, an optimal receiver. And on the other hand, once the, the encoder works very well, um, we train our receiver such that we have such an APP receiver. So um, yeah, I find it quite, quite interesting. And it, it, it really tells us what's going on with this auto encoder in, the, um, in terms of communications or information theoretic perspective. Um, so a few comments, uh, a few disclaimers about this. Um, of course, um, we don't know whether all this converges to the optimum. So we never know whether gradient descent actually achieves the optimal performance. That's something you should always keep in mind. So it's just an optimal training or learning algorithm would achieve this performance, but we don't know whether we actually can achieve that. And it may also happen that we cannot achieve it if we have, for instance, insufficient amount of um, receiver weight. So if the channel is simply too complex, we ordered that the APP uh, receiver cannot be represented by that many weights, then of course there's an, a trade-off between this. So this is something we don't know, but assuming that everything is large enough, uh, we would end up here. And I would like to show a, a quick video of the training. Um, let me see that I have it. Yep. No. So let, okay, maybe I should just let me see. Can you see my browser? Yeah, we can see. Okay, so what what, what we now do is we okay, let's so maybe stop the video. It's a similar video to, to what we have seen in the, before, but now it's a, we have changed our autoencoder to a bitwise information transmission. And um, so we assign bits to every, so instead of having simple indexes, now we use a, a bit index. And um, here now we have a 16 QAM. So we have or 16 messages, alphabet size 16. So we initialize that again randomly and what we see is that we have now, again, these 16 random points. Um, we plot the bitwise mutual information that we achieve with the system. Um, we are somewhere here. So the, the orange curve is the outer encoder. So this is just randomly initialized. And this red bar here shows the, yeah, the gain or loss in terms of the classical baseline. So at the moment, we have a loss of 1.1 bit per channel used. So this is a quite poor performance at the moment. Um, we train this at uh, 3.8 dB. And then here we also visualize the decision regions. So if we have now we have four bits. And for each bit, we have an individual decision. And you can see that the decision regions here are still not yet very clear. And it's just, of course, a result of the random initialization. If we now start the training, you can see that these points move around. Um, this now takes much longer than the, the 8 PSK. And um, you can see that the performance starts to increase. And in the beginning, we, we can also observe a certain clustering. So let's wait for a second. I think now it's a good point. So if you look at this result now, this is a, a more or less a, a QPSK. So we have clustered or 
the system has learned to cluster these points into four different solutions. So this is kind of a, if you want, intermediate um, or local minima of the system. So this is not the optimal solution, but it's, it's somehow a QPSK is a, a quite good result. Um, and we can also see that if you look at the individual bit labels at position zero or one, the first bit, that they are clustered here. So we have four zeros here, we have four zeros here and the ones here. And uh, I think the second bit is also clustered while the third and fourth bit is actually just, just random at the moment. So let's continue the training. And um, it takes quite a lot of training, slight improvements. By the way, one more comment, if you look at the autoencoder at the very high SNR and the very low SNR, you can see that it's, it's absolutely poor performance compared to the baseline. This is exactly this result that here, our receiver is not optimized for this point. So we, we keep in mind, we train at 3.8 dB and the receiver at minus two dB and minus or plus five dB is actually not the true APP receiver. So of course we could include all that in the training process, but for this experiment, it was simply not, not relevant, but it's, 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 it's nice to see. Um, so here we can really see the suboptimal receiver in this uh, regime here. And then we do more training and we see it, it changes towards a more, say eight PSK. And we do more training and, uh, now we have a you know, almost perfect APSK. So it seems to be another um, local minima of such a system. And then, by the way, here you can see the training iterations. We are now at 2,000, 2,100 training iterations with a batch size of 10,000. And then it's, starts to deviate and so the points move in the center and we will end up with this yeah, final solution. We can now see that we have slight gains compared to the, um, to the 16 quam. And we now find a yeah, stable solution that does not change anymore. So if we do more and more training, we will end up with this more or less with this solution here. And now you can also look at the, the bit labels or the, the individual bit decisions here. So the first, the first bit um, is actually all of the points in the, in the negative imaginary part are more or less part of bit equals one. And we can always find these decision regions while for the third bit now the decision regions are in the so that the points of the inner circle are zero and the points of the outer circle are one. And the fourth bit is now really, it's actually even hard to distinguish. Um, yeah. Yeah, this was a visualization of, of, of what's actually going on in the training. And um, yeah, we couldn't continue a bit so you can see that there's a slight improvement in terms of nutrient information. But of course, for such a toy example, classical systems, pretty good. This is just Gaussian noise channel. So this is, Again, a visualization. And hey. how does that compare to the symbolized um, result, symbolized learning? Yeah, that's uh, in terms of nutrient information, it de really depends. So uh, let me just go back to my slide. Uh, okay, so yeah, what we did is we, first of all, we. I don't have the, the results for the, the mutual information, but I have bit error rate results. So we took the, again, the, the QM as a baseline in terms of bit error rate. And then we just used the result of the symbol wise autoencoder and we just tried to label that. So how would you, so what we get is such a constellation here at different SNR points. And then how would you label that? It's it sounds trivial, but if you think about it, it's actually not so trivial because how do you assign a label that's something like pre-labeling for such a such a circle here. So you will always end up with points that have a distance more than one of one bit uh, one bit position and different. It's because you have I don't know six points here and how do you it doesn't work. 
So we try to find a, a heuristic labeling by just brute forcing it or whatever, um, like pre-research and all these things. But it, it, it did not, we can see that it, it's, it's even worse than the, the QAM system. And when we just used uh, random labels, so we just, uh, yeah, assign these random bit labels, the problem is even worse. So what, what's, what's the problem is how do we find the labels for the simple wise autoencoder if we don't include it to the training? And um, if we include it to the training, we just get the, the optimal bit labelings and we can see even improvement to the system. I mean, the gains are, are relatively small in this, in this world because it's, it's a Gaussian channel and the QM system is of course also pretty good here. But it, it shows that if we do the training in the right way, if we do this bitwise training, then we, have a, we still have a gain and not a loss that we would have in the classical simulator out mm -hmm. And Okay, great. Oh, then what about the block error comparison? If you look at the block error rate, would symbol wise training be like better comparable to the bitwise one? Because like my perception is that sim like symbol wise um, training in some sense encourages to reduce the block error rate while bit error rate like the yeah, while bit wise focus on BDR. Yep, yeah. yeah, that's the that's the point. So the if we train the the symbol wise cross entropy, we will have this we have the difficulties in finding the optimal labeling and finding good uh, bit error rate. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if we train if we train the opposite so if you train the bitwise if we have the bitwise training we will have a a pretty poor a uh, simple error rate, if you want. Yeah. I see. So in the, so in the simple error rate wise, um, the, for the simple error rate, um, symbol wise autoencoder does better than bitwise autoencoder. Is that the case? For the simple error rate, yes. Yeah. Okay. It's, it, it, yeah. It's really the metric we optimize. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. So that's the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So how does that work? Simple wise, uh, bitwise training. Now instead of a. Um, a symbol or message index, we now put in bits. So we put in a vector of k bits. And at the output, we train them individually with the binary cross entropy. So now bit zero is either one or zero, bit two is one or zero, and so on. And um, apart from that, the, the, the rest of the training remains the same. We just do end to end training, but we now optimize with a different loss function, if you want. Um, maybe a remark here. If you are familiar with BICM system, so this is now um, actually you, you can relate, or this actually BICM system if you have an um, outer channel code, now it's bit interleaved coded modulation, you can use the, the achievable rates from, from, from classical BICM. And the point is that there's slight degradation in terms of the achievable rate um, by having this individual bit or this bit matrix decoding. So. The output of the decoder of the receiver is now an estimate per bit that does not account for correlations between the individual bits. Um, oops, that would be the video we have just seen. And um, you can also look at the results now that the constellations are fundamentally different. So depending on, on the training SNR, if we train at low SNR, it's also for, so on, the, on the top we have bitwise, on the bottom we have symbolwise training. So it's not just that the labeling is learned, it's really a different constellation. For instance, for the high SNR, you can see a rectangular, it's a classical QM, that's the output of the training. While for the symbol wise training, we still have the circular solution. And um, that's, so it's really fascinating to see that this leads to, to fundamentally different results. And what I also find surprising, we now have changed the training in such a way that the encoder and decoder both get the, the current SNR. So in that sense, the transmitter is now not a, a discrete mapping. It's a continuous function of the SNR. And that allows us to visualize now these constellation points in this for different values of, of SNR. So whenever, of course, it, 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 this requires a good knowledge of, of current SNR, um, but it's more a academic experiment. So we can really find a function now that these points are moving around. So if you change the SNR, we get a, a different constellation. And that's, um, of course, you could optimize with classical algorithms per SNR, for sure. But here, it's now really a continuous function. That's what I find quite surprising that this works. Yeah. OK. 
Okay, then if, if time allows, I have one last um, thing. I guess we still have these five minutes, hopefully. Um, so what is my vision? Um, it's actually something I, I would call a hybrid graph. So we have seen that somehow we need to combine it with outer knowledge, so outer structure. So the problem is training such an outer coder with like uh, several thousand or millions of, of messages doesn't work. We have this exponential training complexity and uh, that doesn't work so well. So what we what we do is we take smaller outer encoders that are optimized for as kind of a channel front end. So they do equalization, they do modulation and demodulation, all these things. And then we combine many of these outer encoders with like a conventional leaf propagation or LDPC code, which is actually nothing else than a sparse uh, sparse graph. So we can just combine that in one large neural network. And the idea is that we only learn the relevant part and we don't learn the, the code structure, which we already know, and we have very good codes, good graphs and all these things. Um, so how does that work? This um, now requires an outer LPC encoder. We use an outer encoder transmitter that now also gets the SNR as an input. Um, we have the channel again, we have our receiver and then we have an iterative receiver structure where we use the feedback from our conventional BP decoder. We feed that back into our outer encoder that has now an additional input. So it has a certain a priori knowledge. And then we train this whole system and we can still train it end to end. So um, for that, we need a loop unrolling. So each iteration is now on loop iteration and then the final output or we train that we just minimize the cross entropy of the final output. Um, you can either train this through the BP decoder or you can use some, some tricks to, to train here, but um, that doesn't matter. And that's the whole that's the whole system, which is now flexible and trainable, but still allows to, to have very large uh, code structures. Um, we can go one step further. I'm not sure how much you're familiar with, with channel coding and LPC codes. Um, so you can still optimize the, the, the LPC code to match that to your autoencoder. You can do that by means of exit charts. So that you can have analytical descriptions of these two variable and check note uh, decoder functions. And uh, the idea is to match or to, to find a degree profile of the code that matches the two, these two curves. And um, maybe one comment about this, um, this result here. So the, the green curve is the trajectory that should, I'm not sure about your background, but that should bounce between the two analytical curves. So the green curve is a measured curve and is really measured over the air. And I find that extremely fascinating. So this is a, after all the, after doing all the math, um, we get a curve that is over the air with trainable components and all these things. And it, it, it is pretty accurate in a sense that it bounces between the two analytical predictions. And um, yeah, this really allows us to optimize the code for this specific setup. Now putting all the things together, we have seen so bitwise autoencoders, um, IDD structures, so iterative detection decodings, so this iterative loop, autoencoders with feedback and um, the optimized LPC code. We get the final results here. Um, so we have done it for M equals six. So this means, um, uh, sorry, should be K here. Um, so two to the power of six is a 64 QM. This is a two to the power of eight. This is a 256 QM, um, which is now trained with the outer encoder. Um, the baseline would be the, the green curve here. And then with an 802.11 LPC code. So this is a relatively strong state of the art code. And then if we do the training of the outer encoder, we see a gain of almost a dB. And if we then optimize the code, we get another 0.2, 0.3 dB to end up with the red curve. And I would say this is quite, an, quite a gain compared to the yeah, relatively well-designed uh, baseline system. And this was also done over the air. So this is really a measurement. Um, and, and it proves that this whole concept we have seen works in practice. Um, and it, it gives bit error rates. That's a relevant matrix in the end that outperforms the classical, the outperforms the classical system here. Yeah. I think that's a, a good point to, to stop. Um, if, yeah, would be happy to, to, to answer any questions. <laughs>